Great. So hello and thank you for coming. Today, Laurie and I will be discussing an advanced contact lens for the treatment and monitoring of glaucoma. This is a project we've worked on together with Rhiannon and Shannon. So according to the World Health Organization, glaucoma is the second most common eye disease to cause blindness. The primary symptom of this disease is elevated intraocular pressure, or IOP, which refers to the pressure in your eye. These elevated pressures cause damage to your optic nerve, and this is what causes the vision loss. The exact causes of glaucoma are not very well known, and they can vary, but it is often attributed to tissue buildup over drainage canals in your cornea that regulate the fluid pressure in your eye. Now, damage caused by glaucoma is permanent, and this puts a lot of importance on monitoring and treating the symptoms as soon as possible. The only long-term solution for glaucoma is an invasive surgery, where new openings are cut into your cornea to allow the fluid pressure in your eye to be relieved. However, this procedure risks many side effects, including infection, inflammation, cataracts, more vision loss, and as if that wasn't enough, you can still have a recurrence of glaucoma after the procedure. For this reason, most patients tend to treat their symptoms only and limit the progression of the disease using medication. So usually this requires the regular administration of eye drops that contain an IOP-reducing drug like Timolol. Now, eye drops are also very ineffective, as most of the effective dose gets washed away by tear fluid, drained down your nasal cavity, or even just blinked onto your cheek. In fact, less than 5% of the dose reaches your cornea. The development of drug-releasing contact lenses, though, they promise to improve the effective dose that's delivered to your eye by increasing the area through which the drug can be delivered. If you think about it, a, um, an eye drop has a very concentrated dose in a liquid droplet that has barely any chance of interacting with your cornea. A contact lens, by comparison, conforms to the shape of your cornea, and it will release the drug from its entire area, thus improving the treatment. Hydrogels are a common material that are used to make contact lenses today. This is convenient because they are polymeric in nature and can be easily modified to absorb and release a drug. And this is what we've done. Our group has designed a drug-releasing contact lens for the treatment of glaucoma, but we've taken this treatment one step further by including a pressure sensor for real-time monitoring of IOP. This will allow for continuous monitoring of, the pressure, of a patient's eye pressure at any time of day without having to visit an optometrist. And while this will be beneficial both to the patient and the optometrist, we also expect that this technology will be beneficial to researchers in the field. They'll have a better idea about drug efficacy as well as what IOP trends are for glaucoma patients. So first we'll talk a little bit about the sensing aspect of our contact lens. So normal human IOP ranges from 10 to 20 millimeters of mercury with variations of about 2 to 6 mmHg. Now a glaucoma patient will experience dramatic spikes in these pressures, reaching values of up to 50 mmHg or higher. These spikes can happen at any time of day over the course of minutes or hours and actually happen most often when they're lying down or sleeping. Now, the standard, measure, the standard method to measure IOP um, at an optometrist's office is Goldman Applanation Tonometry. Now, this method uses a probe which contacts your eye and it flattens your cornea by a certain amount. Visible to the optometrist through the device are two semicircles. When the optometrist has vis visibly aligned these two semicircles to form a circle, they take note of the pressure. Now, as you can imagine, this method's not very accurate, it requires adjustments, and it only gives you one single pressure value that's not characteristic of your IOP trends at all. Now, it is possible to do extended IOP measurements, but it's kind of tricky. It usually requires a patient to be administered to a hospital overnight. They're usually connected to an uncomfortable sensor or have to be woken up continuously to get these pressure measurements. So a comfortable sensor that can be worn at home at any time of day is highly desirable. So the sensor in our contact lens uses a variable gap capacitor. Our contact lens actually has two layers to it. The top layer is a rigid reference layer, <clears throat> and the bottom layer is a flexible um, sensing layer that conforms to the shape of your cornea. Each layer contains a thin copper electrode that together form a capacitor. So when the pressure changes in your eye, this will affect um, the radius of curvature of your cornea. These changes of curvature will change the separation distance between the two contact lenses. And when the separation distance decreases with an increase of pressure, we see a direct increase in the capacitance. So what we get is a sensor that has a continuously varying capacitance um, 
that's changing simultaneously with the changes in pressure. The electrodes of our sensor are made out of chemically etched copper foil. Now, the design came with a bit of a trade-off. We wanted them to be, the electrodes to be as big as possible so that we could have a measurable capacitance and very good signal. But we obviously don't want to block the vision of the wearer. So we situate the <coughs> electrodes at the edge of the contact lens so it's out of the direct line of sight and still made sure it had a big enough area to measure capacitance. You may be wondering about the cog shape design. This actually gives the electrodes more motional freedom so that they can conform well to the shape of the contact lens and to the shape of the cornea. Now, a standard contact lens is about 14 millimeters in diameter. We made our prototype a little bit larger than this just for easier fabrication and handling. So using this design, um, we measured the capacitance, and the video is not playing, and I'm not sure why, but what you'll see is varying capacitance values on the order of tens of picofarads. And this demonstrates excellent sensitivity. So a measurement of about, or a measurement of tens of picofarads will measure a pressure difference of less than one mmHg. If you remember that human IOP has natural variations of two to six mmHg, you can see that our sensor has excellent sensitivity. Now, we do expect that this may be affected slightly when our contact lens sensor is uh, scaled down to the actual size for a human contact lens. But with more sophisticated fabrication techniques, like to make thinner, more uniform lenses, we still expect our sensitivity to be very good. The next step was to actually test this on a human eye. Now, as it turns out, um, modeling a human eye and its changes of pressures is very complicated and it can be very expensive to make a model. Avoiding the alternative of using biological samples, we built our own apparatus. It consists of a syringe that just pumps air into a balloon, and this balloon has a pressure sensor connected to it. So we place our contact lens on the balloon, and we have the contact lens leads connected to a multimeter where we can measure the capacitance, and then we get a direct relationship between the capacitance and the pressure. So this is what we did to make a calibration. We measured it over a pressure range of about 35 to 45 mmHg, which you may note is a somewhat small range, and this was a limitation of our apparatus and not of the sensor itself. Our sensor could measure um, a capacitance value on the or for between 65 and 200 nanofarads over this range, but it can actually encompass a range from picofarads up to 200 nanofarads or higher. The linear relationship of our contact or of our capacitance to pressure relationship is very convenient. It means we can easily interpolate between the points and give a very accurate representation of a patient's IOP for a given capacitance measurement. Now, you have to think that these values will also be scaled down a bit, again, when we um, make the contact lens the correct size for a human. But we still fully expect that our sensor will encompass the range of pressures that a glaucoma patient may experience. Finally, in consideration of this calibration curve, it would be necessary to have one such calibration curve for every contact lens that is made until our fabrication procedures can be highly consistent so that you don't have to do it for every single contact lens. And now Laurie will talk to you about the drug delivery. Great, as Tina has mentioned, our contact lens has two main components. The first is a soft, flexible hydrogel that provides the drug release, and the top one is a more rigid reference lens that acts as a reference for the pressure sensor. First, let's talk about the drug releasing contact lens. There have been many different systems that have been developed that are able to capture a specific molecule, such as a drug with a high affinity and high selectivity, utilizing a method called molecular imprinting. Molecular imprinting polymerization uses the self-assembly of a target molecule with a functional monomer, which then undergoes bulk polymerization in the presence of a solvent to act as a porogen. Then, by removing the target, we are left with cavities that have specific spatial recognition and binding preferences towards our target molecule. Now, since our contact lens we put directly on the eye, ideally we would avoid the use of any organic solvent, which once again is used to create more of a macroporous hydrogel, allowing easy access for the target to reach the cavities. Keeping this in mind, we have developed a synthesis protocol to develop hydrogels that are flexible, solvent-free, 
low cross-linked with a small amount of plasticizer for our drug release application. For our synthesis, our functional monomer is methacrylic acid, which self-assembles with a timolol drug, and this is done by hydrogen and ionic bonds. We then undergo radical polymerization in the presence of our bulk monomer, DEAA. Now initially, the synthesis protocol that we were basing ours off of did not use any plasticizer, so we did not either. We hoped to achieve flexible hydrogels, and we varied the cross-linking concentration, hoping to see different drug release profiles, potentially having the more highly cross-linked hydrogels, having a smaller drug release pro profile, and vice versa. However, what we had found was that our contact lenses were all incredibly rigid, and it was only when we were able to decrease the glass transition temperature by adding a plasticizer were we able to achieve the desired flexibility for our hydrogel application. And with the low cross-linking concentration and our plasticizer, ideally the timolol would have easy access to the cavities without the use of any organic solvent. The temperature of our synthesis was room temperature, and this was crucial for the success of our imprinting. In order to have specific cavities form, it's important that the structural integrity of the target monomer and our target molecule remain intact during bulk polymerization. Now, through literature review, we had found that by having cooler temperatures, such as room temperature, that for our synthesis, it would successfully imprint our timolol drug and therefore was the temperature we had used. Any higher temperatures would have disassembled our cavities. Now looking at our second lens, the reference lens. This was synthesized in the exact same way, except without any timolol, since this lens did not, in, did not contribute to the drug release profile. Additionally, we did not use any plasticizer since this was supposed to be a more rigid reference lens for our pressure sensor. Now to prove that we had in fact created a molecularly imprinted contact lens, we compared our drug release to a control which was a non-imprinted contact lens. And this non-imprinted contact lens was synthesized in the exact same way, just without any timolol, such that there was no timolol specific cavities. And what we had found was that with the control, there was a dramatic decrease in the amount of drug that we were able to absorb and consequently release. It took six hours before even a trace amount of the drug was released from the control lens, but even at this time point, the amount of drug was in the nanogram quantity and therefore not at all therapeutically relevant. Therefore, we were able to show that molecularly imprinting our hydrogel is key in order to deliver a substantial amount of drug to the patient. We also wanted to show that we could tailor the drug dose based on the patient's needs. One way we were able to do that was by changing the timolol loading time that we had our, our contact lens incubating in the timolol solution. We were able to see that by increasing the loading time, we could increase the amount of timolol that we were able to absorb and consequently release, as shown by a 48 to 72 hour increase in our loading time, which provided a 178% increase in the timolol that was released. And additionally, by increasing the timolol concentration in the loading solution, we were also able to show that we could increase the amount of timolol absorbed and consequently released. Now what we developed is a proof of concept. However, if we have more time and more funds, there are some things we would like to look into further. And the first would be to modify the intrinsic imprinting of our contact lens. And we would do this by modifying the amount of functional monomer that we incorporate into our contact lens. And this would modify the number of cavities that is in each contact lens, capping the, timolol, the maximum timolol concentration per lens. And secondly, we would incorporate vitamin E barriers into the contact lens. Now, a vitamin E barrier would increase the effective diffusion path length of our contact lens, providing a longer distance for the timolol to go to reach the eye. And this would ideally prolong the drug diffusion past the six hours that we were currently able to see. Thirdly, we would have to be required to meet the standard contact lens requirements. And this would include 100% transparency, oxygen permeability, as well as being the correct size for a contact lens. And arguably, most interestingly, we would have to create a wireless design. 
Now, and to do this, we could incorporate an inductor into our contact lens to create an LC circuit with the capacitor that we already have. And this would be able to process and transmit our sensor output. And it would work in a very similar way to our pressure sensor, except that the pressure would correlate to resident frequency changes rather than just capacitance changes. And resident frequency changes is more easy and more accurate. And we could then sense that information through an antennae to a nearby device which would then be able to process and send that data to an optometrist. And what the op optometrist could do with that is determine a stable drug dose for the patient. And it's important to note that once the stable drug dose is determined, then the patient would only be required to wear the first layer of the contact lens, which is providing the drug solution, not actually the full sensing contact lens. And the full sensing contact lens might only have to be worn for maybe once every month to act as a checkup to look at the progression of the patient's glaucoma case and see if the dose determined previously is still the most efficient. So what we have is a prototype that can combine both drug release and pressure sensing. And this would allow optometrists to be better able to monitor and to treat the disease and give patients the peace of mind of knowing that they are receiving personalized treatment. Now, what we have developed is a prototype, but this shows that this technology can, in fact, be realized and potentially in the future implemented into the real world market. Thank you. So the idea is the patient would have multiple contact lenses, and so that while one is loading, the other pa the, the person could wear the other contact lens that was previously loaded. Um, also, it is actually important that we have the uh, drug release and the sensor integrated together, because this is more for a research perspective, because then researchers will be able to um, see the effect of drug release um, based on how, like they can see how the pressure is changing based on how the drug is being released. So that's why having the two together is important. Does that make sense? It makes sense to me the research period, yes. but yes, for, for um, lifelong yes, yeah, so for lifelong wearing, the, the sensors would be just like for the routine checkups, but then they would just have the daily drug imprinted single layer lens that Laurie mentioned. So how does your concentration profile of the drug release change? How does it change? Yeah, like it's a diffusion-based profile, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So initially, would you have a very high concentration, and then it slowly decays, then? So yes, initially, uh, we wash the lens before we do our drug release profile, so that there's no timolol on the outer um, lens that would provide the burst release, so that it is all diffusion limited. And once the concentration does start to dwindle from our contact lens, it does decrease. So we would have to base the amount that we load on the patient's uh, drug requirement. Does 